right, so we've just finished playing this game and uh, social studies students, I'm presenting to you here, Dr. Ford, who's a professor of history. And she's gonna talk to us a little bit about how we can possibly start to figure out like from a historical perspective, whether or not the things that our classmates have said are true are indeed true. Take it away. Um, yeah, so this sounds like a really interesting game. I hope you guys had a good time with it. Um, I think obviously one of the most important things if you're thinking about how do we verify things, how do we understand if things are true or not is a couple of things. Number one, corroboration, right? Can we find other sources and other people that are saying similar things at around the same time, right? So the example I've used a lot today is Christopher Columbus, right? Christopher Columbus writing this letter about his travels to the New World, right? And we can corroborate a lot of that information, right? So we know that Columbus set sail in 1492. We know where he went because there's all sorts of corroboration as other people at the same time saying the same thing, right? Um, but there are also a whole bunch of people like 60 years later saying, hey, this is what Columbus did, right? And that doesn't really help us right? Because it's 60 years later. That's not really corroboration. That's somebody kind of using what Columbus said and creating a, a narrative based on that, right? So we're looking for corroboration that happens around the same time, right? We're looking for disinterested corroboration, right? So if Columbus's mom says that he goes to the new world, less useful, right? Because if anybody's going to support your dreams, it's your mom, <laughs> unless she's a terrible mom. You know, right? <laughs> so we're looking for people who are in the, maybe on the journey with him or who are writing about him coming back, who are looking at these artifacts that he's brought back, which mainly he stole people and brought them back and birds. He stole a lot of birds, right? Uh, so we're looking for corroboration, right? We're looking for that sort of thing. Um, and we're looking at his purpose right? We're looking for context and purpose to help us understand where is Columbus coming from? What does he want us to know about this voyage? What does he not want us to know about this voyage? What is he telling us? What is he hiding from us? Who is his audience, All right? So if you guys are presenting truths to each other, your truth is probably not going to be something super duper embarrassing. Okay, maybe, I don't know. I don't know, but it's probably not going to be that, right? Because that's not a thing you want to share with the public. That's not a thing you want to share with a particular, doesn't mean it's not true though. It just means you don't want to share it with this particular audience slash and your mom is the only one who can corroborate it. <laughs> I'm assuming mom's <laughs> embarrassing things. Embarrassing thing, yes. <laughs> right? Yeah, one or just, two things just pop. Anyway. Yeah, see, moms, <laughs> they know stuff, right? So when you're thinking about these these two truths and these lies, you're thinking about what can I prove, what can I not prove, and also we have to understand that that is sometimes more complicated than we would like it to be, right? So we can prove, it is true that in 1492, Columbus set sail on the ocean blue, right? That's just, that's a fact, unless you're going by like different time, it, it gets complicated very quickly, right? But we can prove that that is true, right? can we prove that Columbus was successful? Well, that starts to get a little more complicated, right? Because how do we define success, right? How do we decide if what Columbus is saying about the people that he's meeting, if it's true or not true, right? Some of it we can corroborate because he steals them and brings them back to Spain, right? So if he's talking about certain physical characteristics or things like that and he's like well the people he brought back seem to match these physical characteristics but he's also talking about stuff like they are stupid we can conquer them right that is much harder to corroborate right because it turns out the thing you need to conquer them is smallpox <laughs> which he doesn't talk about in his letter at all right and so you know, sort of peeling back layers to verify things, right? You're looking for what other people are saying at the same time. You're looking for people who are not necessarily interested in just supporting Columbus, right? So you're, you're looking for complications, hmm. right? Because history is all about 
complications. Historical thinking is all about complications. It's like, why did this happen at this particular time? What kind of effects did it have? Right? And those are really complicated questions to ask about even really small events. Right? So historical thinking should help you make sense of the world as a complicated place. Right? And one of the things you're looking for is you can't just take it as, as God's truth because somebody wrote it down. Right? So Columbus writes down this letter and he's like, this is what I've seen. This is what I've done. And just because he wrote it down doesn't mean it's true. Right? Unless other people are also supporting what he's saying, it's just a dude writing something down on a piece of paper. As, as you said earlier, a rando on a boat. <laughs> right? Yeah, he's, he's a rando on a boat who shows up to a place for people. He doesn't speak their language. He has no idea what's happening. He just shows up on a boat in a skirt with a flag. <laughs> right? So, and, uh, so talk yes. about uh, primary sources. Mm -hmm. <sighs> yes. So, what, primary sources. So primary, primary sources. Yeah. Primary sources are the best thing that have ever existed for historians because they are things that were created during the time period that we're studying and they can be almost anything, right? So obviously we've talked about Columbus's letter, right? That's, that's a clearly a primary source like government documents are obviously primary sources. Um, but I've seen people use like recipe cards, right? So like your great grandmother's recipe for some terrible great depression pie that's a primary source and you can talk about like oh so these foods may have been more available at this time these foods may have been less available oh it's world war ii everyone's eating cottage cheese all the time right like you can use anything songs yeah. movies anything that's created during the time but just because it's created doesn't mean it's true <laughs> just means it's been created <laughs> right um so you want to think about what it is that has been created and what its audience is, right? So someone writing in their diary, right? You would hope they would be a little more honest, but it's for a very specific audience, right? It's for an audience of themselves, right? Someone writing a government document or like a, a government policy, right? They're gonna use very different kinds of language, different kinds of people are gonna be reading that, right? And as a historian, your job is to take all of these things and put them together to form an argument. Right? And to understand how each one of these comes from a specific perspective, right? none of them are 100% of the story. But if you take little parts of them that you can corroborate with other parts of them, then you can create an argument. And then you can start asking some really interesting questions about how and why things happen. Hmm. And that's the cool part about being a historian. Said by a historian. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> other people might disagree. Yeah, that sounds like the fun part, the puzzle part. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah it takes you on some weird journey all right well um sounds good do you want to talk for a second about um this stumbling block of bias yes i love talking about this so when students come into my class, right, one of the things that I'm supposed to help them learn is this sort of historical thinking, critical thinking, right? How do we read appropriately, right? Um, but what they wind up doing is they've created this dichotomy in their brain, which says this source is unbiased and therefore it is good. And this source is biased and therefore it's bad, right? And what we're looking for is a, a more holistic understanding that everybody that's creating these sources is a human, right? They all come from very specific backgrounds. They all have very specific purposes, right? And all of the people who are creating the history are historians. We're also human too, right? So my background, my interest, my family history, the fact that I'm an Appalachian historian, all of that comes into play as I'm, as I'm writing. Bias is not bad so long as it is understood and contained. Right. So long as we understand that just because I say something doesn't mean it's true. Right. But that the things that I say and the things that I argue are informed by who I am. Mm -hmm. Right. And the things that Columbus says, they're informed by who Columbus is and his background and his interest in sailing to Asia to make money off of spices. 
right? So bias isn't bad, but what you have to watch for is this bias overtake the larger search for truth. Right, so one of the things that all historians are like, we're looking for truth, we're looking for truth, we're trying to figure out what the truth is, while understanding that as humans, that's really tricky, right? But anyone who comes and says, I am unbiased, here is the truth, believe only me, pay no attention to anybody else, that's a really big red flag, <laughs> right? Don't listen to that person, they're not, they're not helping you, right? So what you're looking for is an understanding of your own biases and your own background, right? And what's going on with these primary sources, right? And that works for anything you're reading. That works for a Columbus letter that works for a newspaper article written today, right? And we're always looking for these deeper skills and this understanding of purpose and audience and corroboration. Yeah, that brings about? us to <laughs> the fake news part. Like, yes. basically, if we cannot corroborate, mm -hmm. we cannot at, find uh, uh, other sources that kind of point in the same direction. Mm -hmm. This is where we start to get real fake news as opposed to fake news as a claim. <laughs> right. And it's, it's so interesting to me that we have all of this, like, oh, this is fake news. It's fake news. Like, just because you don't like it doesn't mean it's fake news. It just means you don't like it. Right. But if you are saying something and you are like over here in a pond all by yourself and no one else is coming to your, no one else is saying the things you're saying, no one else is playing in your pond. I don't know why I chose a pond metaphor, but that's fine. Right. That's a bad sign. Right. Like that's not, that's not how this works in terms of news media, in terms of historical scholarship. Right. So there are historians who would argue that like, the Holocaust doesn't exist, right? But we don't have conversations with those people because they can't corroborate any of their evidence. They're just shouting into the wind, right? They are over here in the corner, right? Because they can't prove any of their claims. They just don't want to think that it happened. And so then they argue a whole bunch that it didn't happen, which is terrible. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I always somehow bring like genocide into every conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. No, well, that is one of the things that gets labeled fake news. So, yeah. Yeah. Right, like, so hopefully, none of my students today included that in their fake news example. I hope not. But, weird. And by today, of course, I mean the day that we do this. Right. Class, which is not the day that we are in. Speaking of corroboration and around that time yeah um all right well uh thanks for helping us you're welcome and i hope it was useful if they have any questions i'll have them email you that's totally fine you can put up my email address in like big letters now if you want to oh no, and, and it'd be good uh uh for them to to have some interaction with you if they haven't had you in class um but thanks for your time and um yeah, we'll get back to our game. All right. Have fun. Thank you. <laughs>